Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to OSU Extension's Agricultural Natural Resources Madness Tournament of Education. I'm Julie Strausser. I'm a program assistant with the department. And today we are going to wrap up the sheep bracket. And back with us is Christine Gelly, our Agricultural Natural Resources Educator from Noble County, and Brady Campbell, who is the program coordinator for our OSU Sheep Team. And if you'd missed them this morning, those recordings will be available on our Agmanis website for review. And so Brady, if you wanna go ahead and start sharing your screen and I'll go ahead and let you guys get started. Thank you, Julie. Thank you for working to set these webinars up for us. It's uh, surely been helpful. It's definitely made me feel like we're connecting with our people despite the challenges we face at this time. And uh, shout out to Brady for hours of working on these in preparation as well. Uh, Brady's gonna do a lot of the talking today, but I'm gonna get us started with overviewing some of the things uh, that we would consider normal. You have to know what's normal before you know what's abnormal. So it's a pleasure to meet you. If this is your first time joining us for the webinar, we are Brady and Christine. And uh, we hope that if you missed the webinars this morning, you'll go back and check those out later. So we'll start off by defining what do we consider normal when we look at an animal to evaluate its health. We'll then move into administering medications uh, and then reviewing some very common health issues that you may see with your sheep. So how can you tell if an animal is behaving normal? Well, you need to have some experience with them and observe what's normal and what's abnormal. Um, but things that you can look at are common behaviors that they display when they are content. Chewing their cud, making uh, bleeding noises that are normal, social sounds, the way that they hold their ears, uh, the way that they move as a flock. When you look for things that are abnormal or abnormal, clearly they're gonna be contrasting to those normal behaviors. You'll notice different uh, behavior in how they move, how they interact with each other, the sounds that they make. They may um, demonstrate signs of distress by itching and scratching on surfaces. Uh, you can tell sometimes by looking in the eyes. If, you, if the eyes are not clear and vibrant, that's a distinct sign that something may be wrong. Decreased vigor is probably the most common sign that something is wrong with your animal, but it's often one of the harder things to catch if you have a fairly large flock. Um, but your animals should be eager to come and eat, eager to go out and graze. And if they are behaving slow, that's a sign that they're not doing well. An arched back is another common sign that the animal's not performing well. Know how to take a temperature and what's normal. The normal body temperature for sheep is between 102 and 103 degrees Fahrenheit. If it's over that, they're running a fever. And if it's under that, they could be hypothermic. So um, if something seems to be wrong with that am animal, a good place to start is by taking a body temperature, as well as doing things with visual assessments. Look at the conformation of that animal from its feet all the way up to the face. Uh, check over the mouth. When you have an animal that isn't eating well, there could be an issue just right in the mouth, and that could be the start of the problem. Uh, something we've commonly seen throughout a couple challenging summers has been issues with foxtail, which sometimes can be the root of a problem. You could have foxtail particles. The ons could be stuck in the, the upper lip causing issues. Uh, so evaluate the animal from toe to tip of the tail and um, check for things that seem to be abnormal. Another good thing to look at is the manure. And that goes for all animals, not just, see, just sheep. But um, what goes in should match what comes out. And we have some things we look at with manure to determine if it's normal or abnormal as well. And then another thing to look at is the body condition score. We're gonna talk more about these things as we move on. So when it comes to manure and knowing what's normal, what we're looking for is um, feces that holds a shape like a pellet, but is also still sticky. You do wanna see some clumping together of those feces. They shouldn't be hard like black beans, um, but you do want them to be squishy 
And um, on the other hand, you don't want them to be runny either. When you see things like slimy, runny poop, that's typically diarrhea and could be tied to all kinds of different issues um, with health. One thing that we do a lot in uh, pasture management is look at poop to try to decide if we have our fiber concentrations right in the diet, which we talked a lot about in the previous webinar. Um, but poop can tell you a lot. So you wanna look for that normal poop. And if you have poop that's too dry or poop that's too wet, that's a sign that you have a problem. When it comes to body condition scoring, this can be an extremely helpful tool for classifying your animals for those that are underweight, overweight, or right on track for where they need to be. When we look at these two examples, are either of these acceptable animals for production? The answer is no. One is extremely thin on the low side of the body condition score, and the other is extremely fat and obese. So you have both ends of the uh, scoring system demonstrated in this picture. We are looking for healthy animals to be somewhere in between, at between a two and a three, um, and sometimes up to a four. It depends on what type of market you're trying to fit with your animals, but we shouldn't have ones and we shouldn't have fives. Here is an example of um, what that animal is gonna look like when it comes to fat and muscular structure. And when you do a body condition score, what you're really doing is feeling for that fat deposition uh, and uh, how much fat covers over the spine as well as on the hips. Uh, so when you have an extremely thin animals, extremely thin animals um, are gonna have hardly any fat on them. And the fat animals are gonna have a lot of fat cover. It may be difficult to even feel where the spine is. The best way to get good at body condition scoring is to practice, practice, practice. Do this uh, at home in your day-to-day -day working of the animal so you get to know what's normal and what's abnormal. And the more regularly you do this, the better suited you will be to catch issues as they start to arise. If animals are too thin, it's likely that they are sick or not getting enough food. If they're too fat, it's likely that they are overeating. And that could be an issue with other members of your flock or that animal specifically. As I mentioned before, we wanna be somewhere between a two and a four, kind of ideally shoot for that three average body condition score to have a consistently healthy animal. I'm going to unmute Brady so that he can come back in here soon. He has the presentation open for me, so we can't see. Uh, so when we think about disease, there have to be three components of the disease triangle present for disease to occur. This disease triangle is used in um, all kinds of different life cycles and identifying disease. It's the same for plants as it is for animals. In order for a disease to occur, you have to have a susceptible host. And in our case, that would be our sheep. The environment has to be conducive for the pathogen to survive. And then the pathogen itself has to be present. Whether that pathogen is a bacteria, a virus, a fungus, or a parasite, if it's not there, we can't have disease. If there's no host, we don't have disease. And if the environment is not conducive for that pathogen to thrive, we won't have disease either. So depending on what disease we're facing, the decisions you make as a manager can affect this disease triangle and take one of those factors out so that you can prevent the occurrence of disease. But when all three coincide, you are most likely to uh, contract diseases that are present in your environment. So in general, which one of these do we have the most control over that we can make a difference for? It's typically the environment. As livestock managers, it's our job to provide the most conducive environment for our animals to thrive in. And we wanna make sure that our environment is conducive for them to thrive, not for pathogens to thrive. Very good. Thank you, Christine, for getting us uh, kicked off there. Uh, Christine did an excellent job in terms of 
taking a look at what we need to be looking at in our animals visually and also in the environment to figure out what may be occurring. So now that we've identified what may be potentially going on, I thought it would be beneficial to talk a bit about how are we going to administer these different types of medications. Uh, we're going to go through several types of disease scenarios throughout this presentation as well, but I thought it was a good idea for us to get a pretty good handle of how to administer uh, these medications to these animals given the disease that we have found. Uh, them. We know there are several routes of administration. Uh, the first of which is going to be our oral uh, administration, or PO. Um, these are going to be for drenches such as our anthelminics or dewormers. Uh, we've got different pastes out there that maybe um, it, it could be a, a supplement for a mineral. Uh, that could also be a probiotic, prebiotic. Uh, fluids may be required if an animal is dehydrated and such. Um, we want to ensure uh, the proper location of our dosing gun. Uh, here in this top picture, we've illustrated a dosing gun uh, for, for a drench gun itself. Typically, we've got that knob or ball on the end of that syringe, the end of that uh, mechanism, and we want to ensure that that is on the back side of the tongue. Uh, once that is placed on the back side of that tongue, that will ensure that, that animal will swallow that medication or that supplement that we are giving to them and make sure it goes to the appropriate location. Uh, sometimes when we administer that too shallow, it could be amongst the tongue and in the mouth, uh, we, get, we tend to get these animals to cough. Well, that means we went down uh, the wrong hole. And uh, we can get some of that medication into the, uh, into the lungs ultimately, and that's not going to be effective whatsoever. So again, we want to ensure that we avoid this shallow type of administration. Our other route of administration is going to be subcutaneous. So that means we're just going to do it right under the skin. Uh, in that fat layer. So these are going to be for our shots, whether that be antibiotics or vaccines that we may be giving. Uh, in this picture here, we've got a really good il illustration of a subcutaneous type of injection. We just want to pinch that skin and tint it, make that tint as you can see. So this individual giving this, uh, this um, shot itself has tinted that skin, pulled it up. We want to ensure that we don't poke that needle through one side of the skin and out the other. So be cognizant of that. And you can see that he is running parallel with the body of the animal. It's pretty important there. If we were going to be an eye perpendicular to the body, but for the subcutaneous, we want to make sure that we're running parallel uh, with the body and parallel to the muscle. Once we have administered this vaccine, this shot that we're giving, we want to make sure that we massage that area in case that medication may be, be you know, accumulated in that fat layer uh, underneath that skin. Uh, we wanna make sure an even distribution of that medication as well. And it's always good to feel the area in which you're giving these medications as well. Just in case we did accidentally poke through the other side and we've administered uh, that, that shot that we were giving on the outside of the skin because we know that's also not an effective vaccination program or treatment protocol. Those two certainly aren't the only methods that we have available to us. Uh, some others are our intramuscular, as I just mentioned. Uh, some uh, of our, our antibiotics, vaccines, hormones require that they go IM or intramuscularly. So I recommend that you uh, read all of your labels on any type of uh, medications or hormones or vaccines that you may be giving, and certainly consult uh, with your local veterinarian or that veterinarian that you work with on your farm. Now, these shots are intended to be placed directly into the muscle. And again, this picture dictates it quite well. Uh, we want to put that uh, shot, that vaccine, uh, whatever we're giving, uh, directly into that muscle. So we're going to administer that perpendicular to the mu muscle of that animal. We also have the option of IV or intravenous. Uh, we want to ensure that this, uh, this happens uh, slowly. Uh, typically, we as producers will not be giving any type of of medications, uh, IV that'll that'll be uh, left up to the uh, to the work of your your veterinarian or that uh, healthcare provider for your animals that you're working with. Um, but it is an important skill to know because uh, at times we may be pulling blood as producers to send in blood samples to get our herd or flocks tested uh, for certain diseases, health statuses. If we're trying to get into some accredited programs, it's also extremely beneficial in terms of uh, testing for parasites, looking for anemia, but also pulling blood and 
uh, to take a look and see if your flock is pregnant and we can monitor pregnancy status of your flock quite easily and quite uh, readily available uh, to do that as well. When we're doing this, we wanna make sure that we approach this animal at this 45 degree angle as we've seen here uh, in the picture um, located off to the right of the screen. Um, we want to uh, pinch off that vein uh, in the neck as you can see here uh, with your uh, non-dominant hand and then with your dominant hand, you're going to insert that syringe and needle and, and pull back that blood back into the system. So again, using that 45 degree angle, um, we wanna make sure that as soon as we pierce that skin, we kind of move a bit rapidly because if we go too slow, that needle will actually roll off the side of that, um, that uh, vein uh, that we're trying to pull from and we won't be able to, to successfully pull any blood. And then uh, finally, for those that uh, may be in the dairy industry, uh, you can do this a local uh, treatment in the form of intramammary uh, treatment. Not as common as we would see in the dairy uh, industries in terms of, of uh, cattle and goats, uh, but there are a few sheep dairies out there that can utilize this to their benefit. So kind of jumping right into some of our um, health issues, uh, the one that's really near and dear to me being a PhD student in the Department of Animal Sciences a lot of my studies are revolving around internal parasites. So we'll talk just a bit uh, on this topic here. But as we know, internal parasites and the biggest one that we're concerned with here in Ohio is gonna be uh, Homonchus contortus or the barber pole worm. Now we know that these internal parasites, uh, as an infection ensues upon this animal, we know that uh, anemia can occur or a loss of, of circulating red blood cells. Uh, we also know that in, Sometimes, depending upon the infection, the level of infection and the type of infection, we can see scours. So that's why it's important to take a look at that fecal material, as Christine noted earlier. Weight loss is certainly something that we can monitor, but weight loss is not always associated with uh, just parasitic infection. A lot of uh, diseases, issues can cause weight loss in our animals. And then overall ill thrift. Off to the right hand side, you can see that uh, this is one of our control and checking mechanisms here uh, using this um, template. Uh, typically uh, through extension, we do offer these FOMACHA trainings. Uh, so be, be on the lookout for that as um, our, our um, economy and our world allows us to do so during this pandemic. But uh, we like to have something like this at least once a year and provide that to our producers. But for those that aren't familiar with it, the FOMACHA I scoring system uh, was developed uh, by a professor down in South Africa. And what this is, is it gauges the level of anemia uh, within a system of an animal. We're gonna use this pull, push, pop technique. So we're gonna pull down this eyelid, the bottom eyelid. We're gonna push in the uh, upper eyelid, which is gonna result in that lower eyelid kind of popping out. What we're gonna do is we're going to correlate this eye color, this mucosal membrane with the scoring card itself. It's a one through five scoring system. A one's gonna represent a healthy animal. It's gonna have a bright cherry red mucosal membrane uh, because that animal will have plenty of circulating red blood cells. And as we transition to a five, you can see it's very white. So this pearly white appearance would be indicative of an animal that may be under uh, some type of parasitic infection and it's an animal that we need to assess immediately. I should note that the FOMACHA I scoring system is only valid when we're evaluating infections associated with Homonchus contortus. The second of which uh, that uh, you can either perform at home or you can submit these samples to your local veterinarian is uh, fecal egg counts or FECs. And this is a really good indication of overall parasitic burden within your flock. Uh, this represents the number of eggs being shed or deposited on pasture per gram of fecal material. We do know through some uh, research that uh, a mature homonchus female has the ability to deposit five to 10,000 eggs on a daily basis. So even if you only have a slight infection, uh, it can, it can um, manifest quite quickly and the issues can, can certainly happen quite rapidly. The other piece of uh, control or, or monitoring devices that we can utilize in our systems is this PCV or our pack cell volumes. Now our pack cell volumes are simply just taking a look at the proportion of red blood cells among a blood sample. And I've got a really nice picture here, some from some of my grazing trials that we have. 
The dark red in these microhematocrit capillary tubes is going to be our red blood cells that we have in both of these examples. And then overall, you can see where the, it, it's kind of shiny on, on both of these tubes here. This represents the entire sample. So from this white plug up here to this shiny level, that would be the whole blood sample. This lower portion again would be our red blood cells. And the rest of this shiny proportion is going to be the plasma within our system. Now at Ohio State, when we were doing this, this is what we monitor our lambs. And this dictates when our animals get, uh, um, when they receive an anthelmintic. Uh, for treatment. And our cutoff is going to be at 21%. So here you can see, for example, this animal has a PCV of 32. Uh, that's a good animal. He's, he's uh, perfectly healthy out on pasture. As we transition to the left here, you can see that this was a PCV of 8. Very few circulating red blood cells. Therefore, he'll have a decrease in overall carrying capacity for oxygen and also nutrients among the system. So, you know, as managers and livestock producers, we found out some tools, you know, how we can manage parasites quite easily and effectively, and that's with the use of anthelmintics or our deworming products. And these are certainly the most common form of parasite management. Unfortunately, due to the overuse and continued use of these products, we have developed what we call anthelmintic resistance. This anthelmintic resistance is just simply the heritable capability of these parasitic nematodes to survive what we would consider an effective anthelmintic dose. So we may be wondering, well, how does this occur? What causes this? A lot of times it's due to underdosing. Uh, you know, farmers are guilty of it. And um, unfortunately, not a lot of people have access to weigh scales. And I understand it takes a lot of time uh, to do so. But what's really important is that we need to weigh each individual to determine the amount of anthelminic that they need. So if you're not able to take an entire day to weigh every animal on your farm, we should at least identify our heaviest weighing animals within our flock, get their weight of the heaviest animal, and then we will treat everybody in the flock at that heaviest dose. Therefore, everyone will have received an effective dose of anthelminic. We may be over-treating them, but certainly nobody is under-treated. Repetitive use, 30 plus years ago, it was recommended that we deworm on a calendar basis. However, through continued research, we have found that it, that is no longer the recommendation. The recommendation is that we should be treating on an as needed basis to reduce the exposure of these anthelmintic products uh, to our livestock. Another piece of the puzzle that causes anthelmintic resistance is that we may have failed equipment. All of us have our own drenching guns, uh, but it's important that we take care of these pieces of equipment. All of these drenching guns have a, have a barrel associated with them where that anthelminic is uh, charged up into. And then once we press the plunger or the trigger, uh, it will travel through that barrel into the, the neck of that syringe and then be deposited in the animal. But our equipment, as it ages, um, those O-rings that are associated with that plunger sometimes get a bit stale, they can get cracked, and if they're not properly taken care of and lubricated, we can allow air pockets to get into that system. As we allow air into that system, uh, we decrease the amount of anthelmintic being placed into the barrel of that chamber, and therefore we are underdosing our animals. I've also got in here a decrease in refugia populations of parasites. Those are simply just parasites that are found and housed out on pasture that have never been exposed to anthelminic products. And although we don't cover it here in this webinar, uh, we've got some uh, information online on our OSU Sheep Team webpage where we talk about the potential transfer of anthelminics uh, through the milk via the dam to the offspring. I also wanted to give you guys uh, this anthelminic deworming table uh, for you, for your own reference, because a lot of times people, uh, producers will come to me and say, well, I've, I've switched amongst different types of, of anthelmintic products or dewormers, and I don't know why they're still, uh, my sheep are still coming up as being parasitized. So I will ask what type of dewormers they've been using. They'll say, we'll use ivermectin, and then we went to cydectin. But as you can see, ivermectin and cydectin are all within this macro lactone uh, anthelmintic classification, and therefore they never left that drug classification. So it's important to have a good understanding of uh, what drug classification these trade names of these um, anthelminics that we're using are associated with.
So just very briefly, again, it's not a parasite talk, but I wanted to mention some uh, alternative management practices that we could implement on farm as a way to reduce the use of these anthelmintics. So one that's the most obvious is that confinement. We can simply put our sheep inside and get them away from the parasites themselves out on pasture. However, that can be quite costly due to infrastructure costs and, and management costs as well. We've already talked about it extensively, judicious use of these anthelmintics, so only use uh, anthelmintics when needed, when you have a heavy parasitic burden. There are different breeds out there. There are some hair type sheep breeds, and there's also some terminal uh, type breeds that have a type of tolerance uh, or have specific levels and varying levels of tolerance uh, to parasitic infection itself. There's research conducted at Ohio State actually during my master's career that shows that there is a huge benefit to delayed weaning. So allowing those lambs to remain with their mother if you decide to raise these lambs out on pasture. Mineral supplementation plays a big role. And for those of you that missed out on uh, this afternoon's webinar on sheep nutrition, I, I encourage you guys to go back and listen to that recording to see the importance of mineral supplementation. Protein supplementation. Uh, because these parasites are blood sucking organisms, uh, we are um, making these animals deficient in protein. So if we supply additional protein to these animals to make up for that deficiency, that works out quite well as well. Out of season breeding, if we create these lambs uh, and we, if we breed here in a couple of weeks, we have some fall lambs, thinking about the weather patterns uh, as the fall comes, and thinking about the parasite life cycle, parasites don't thrive and survive well during the cooler months. So if we're actually grazing those lambs during the fall and winter months, that may also help us in terms of reducing the parasitic burden. Pasture management grazing strategies, as we know, can be quite beneficial, uh, as well as different forage management strategies. Uh, you know, whether that be rotational grazing or the way that we're managing and housing those animals out on pasture. There are some alternative forages, some that have high tannins within them uh, that do help with parasitic burden. And there's a lot of neat future technology that is coming out, one of which is a, a fungus that we can feed. It's sold under the label of Bioworma. It's naturally occurring. Uh, you can feed that to your animals on a daily basis while out on pasture and it's an effective tool to use to decrease the parasitic burdens of your flock as well. Aside from internal parasites, we do have some other nutritional issues that cause health-related uh, disease. The first of which that we'll go over here first is gonna be white muscle disease. Um, so I've kind of got these uh, nutritional health issues lined out like this. We're gonna talk about what causes it, what are some of the consequences and, and how can these be avoided? So what causes white muscle disease? It's gonna be a deficiency in the mineral of selenium and or the vitamin of vitamin E. Um, here in Ohio specifically, we our soils and our forages are quite deficient in selenium itself. Uh, so we wanna ensure that we provide a nice supplement of selenium uh, to our animals. So whether that be a free choice mineral uh, and or an injection of, of both C can also be an effective means of, of getting that, uh, that selenium mineral to these individuals. Uh, there's also PACE out there for selenium and vitamin E. Vitamin E is kind of a cofactor. Uh, so if you're deficient in selenium or vitamin E, uh, the other tends not to work nearly as well. What are some of the consequences of this? So how, as you as a producer and manager, be able to identify what may be occurring in your flock? An inability to walk. Uh, these animals will exhibit uh, pain when they perform, try to perform normal functions. Uh, they may have an arched back, as you see this lamb in the in the picture off to the right. Also, some cardiac symptoms include uh, labored breathing. Uh, selenium deficiency um, really attacks these these white muscles or white striated muscles, and the heart, being cardiac muscle, is going to be one of those white muscles that it definitely uh, targets as well. So again, how can this be avoided? Just supplementation of that selenium, whether that be in the form of mineral, injection, or an oral paste. The next issue that we'll cover here is uh, urinary calculi or kidney stones. Uh, what, does the, what causes this? It's, it's an imbalance of two minerals, and those two minerals are gonna be our calcium and phosphorus. It's important to know when you're uh, manufacturing feeds or you're mixing feeds yourself that uh, you get your calcium to phosphorus ratio spot on and it needs to be about a two to one, two parts calcium to one part 
phosphorus. One issue that we do see is that certain sources of water uh, can actually um, mess with the, the balance of these two minerals. So what happens if you, um, if you mess up the balance of the calcium and phosphorus ratio? We will see that there may be a buildup of calcium within that urinary tract and it'll result in kidney stones. We see this to be more of an issue in weathers because they do not have a fully developed uh, urethra. Um, the next category of, of animal that's the most susceptible will be our males and then finally our females. It's not often seen in our females, but it certainly can occur. But uh, this, the group of animals that we certainly need to be watching are, are gonna be our castrated males. So how can we avoid this? Just ensure that with your feed labels, your feed representative, or your local feed mill when you're making your rations that you have that appropriate balance of calcium and phosphorus. And if you have questions about whether your mineral balance is, is out of whack in terms of your water source, it's always nice to get your water tested as well. Another health related issue in the nutritional sector is gonna be acidosis. Uh, what causes this? It's an abrupt change in that diet and it typically is associated with our grain-based diet. So bringing these animals uh, on to feed too rapidly. Uh, for example, my family and I had just weaned a group of lambs. So what we need to ensure is that we don't bring these lambs onto uh, their um, growing and finishing rations uh, too quickly. Uh, their um, digestive systems aren't, um, they're not programmed quite yet to take on full feed in terms of a full grain diet. Uh, they were still used to grazing with mom. Uh, as well as nursing from her as well. So they've got to have time and adjust in time period. Um, what also causes this is a decrease in rumination. Perhaps they have a lack of, of um, long stem uh, forage or any type of forage source that doesn't allow for rumination to occur. So what are some signs of acidosis? We do see a decrease of feed intake, uh, diarrhea, anorexia, uh, some of these lambs will actually stand around and, and just kind of moan in physical pain, and that's also a good indicator that something's wrong digestively. How can this be avoided? Uh, we can provide roughages to our animals, keep these animals hydrated, uh, and then also some sodium bicarbonate. That's just a buffer uh, to bring that pH uh, acidosis or load of, um, of an acidic environment uh, within that digestive system. Um, those high grain diets will create an acidic pH uh, within the rumen. Uh, so we'll provide some sodium bicarb uh, in that diet. Baking soda will work just fine uh, to kind of neutralize uh, that pH and bring that back up to an appropriate measure. On the other spectrum, we also have bloat, kind of similar to uh, acidosis, but this, this mainly occurs with, um, with our forages themselves. Yeah, they do. And on that note, I'm going to jump in on this slide. And um, so bloat, I, I think in a lot of ways that bloat is more of a symptom than it is a condition. There are many things that can cause bloat. It could be a change in the diet. We know that overconsumptions of legumes can cause bloat. Um, and that usually happens when we turn our animals out onto a lush pasture full of legumes and they overconsume and that causes bloat to occur. Sometimes bloat could be linked to a blockage in the digestive system. If you remember a while back, we shared some information about stomach obstructions. Obstructions could occur in a variety of places throughout um, the digestive tract, but a blockage on either end to either prohibit uh, regurgitation or to prohibit release of gas through the other end can cause bloat as well. And then many animals that have a clostridia infection can demonstrate bloat um, when you find that they've perished. And that seems to be the most obvious symptom that you see. And it can come on extremely fast so that it's difficult to recognize what's wrong until you find the animal perished. What are the signs and symptoms of, of bloat? That the animal starts to bloat. Uh, they that demonstrate that they're um, uncomfortable. They may kick at their sides. Um, they may lay around in discomfort with their, their mouths open. Um, that's a sign that the rumen is filling up with gas. How can we avoid this? Well, we need to make those changes to their diets slower. As Brady mentioned before, sometimes when we 
um, switch animals to a new diet, the shock to the system can cause a variety of problems. And bloat can be one of those things. So slowly introduce animals to a, a new um, diet, whether that's when you turn them out onto grass right now in the spring, or if you're bringing them into a confinement system to uh, feed them out for the market. In either case, make those changes slow. And as we're gonna talk about in a bit, and we've mentioned already, one of the good ways is to vaccinate uh, with CDNT as well. Aside from that, as, as Christine noted, that CDNT vaccination is, is ideal in any type of, of scenario. Uh, but one of the main reasons that we do recommend that is to uh, reduce issues associated with this, and this is enterotoxemia. Um, enterotoxemia is caused by um, CND. Um, this is commonly known as overeating disease, too. So, again, uh, these uh, these bacteria will proliferate uh, in these acidic environments or these high grain diets that are being uh, fed to our animals. Again, what are some of the signs and symptoms, uh, physical signs of pain, uh, loose stool, and then also visible blood in the, the manure itself. Um, when we try to correct for this, unfortunately, uh, once physical symptoms occur, uh, there's little hope in terms of trying to get these animals to recover. But what can what can we do as managers on the front end to uh, reduce our risk associated with enterotoxemia? Uh, first of which is vaccination. Uh, second of which is maybe provide some type of antibiotics, um, but uh, due to the reduction of antibiotics in our, our feed systems, that's no longer recommended uh, as well. So vaccination and also ensuring that we have this clean feeding area, so reduce fecal contamination in the feeders, waters, and anywhere that these lambs are gonna be directly uh, interacting with their feed sources. Kind of dig a little deeper into this subject because I've had several questions regarding enterotoxemia and tetanus this year. I thought it warranted an extra slide. Uh, again, overeating disease is uh, its common uh, nomenclature. It's naturally present in our environments and within our animals themselves, just at low levels. So uh, as we provide these animals with these high grain diets, it just causes an over proliferation of these bacteria themselves because they have fuel. We're just simply fueling the fire if we uh, add a lot of grain really quickly to the diets of these animals. For Clostridium perfringens type C, uh, these are gonna be found around the farm in the soil or the manure pack. Um, as a result of those used laying down in that pack, it can get onto their udders. And then also we see that this enterotoxemia is commonly affects these excessive nursing lambs. So they're always continuously uh, putting themselves uh, at risk due to their excessive uh, nursing uh, nature. Um, it's important to note that the enterotoxemia typically affects, uh, as you can see in our next point down here, um, the biggest and fastest growing lambs, right? And Clostridium perfringens types D is our biggest culprit with overeating. So again, our most aggressive lambs in terms of eating, whether that be nursing or eating that, those grain products, those are the lambs that are going to um, allow their bacterial populations to proliferate the quickest and fastest and ultimately perish due to this quickly rapidly occurring disease caused by these bacterial infections. Tetanus, now this, you may also have heard this as referred to as uh, locked jaw or stiff lamb disease. Now this is gonna be caused by Clostridium tetani. And this is gonna enter the body through an open wound. And you may be thinking, where are these open wounds occurring? Uh, if you think about our lambs, any of them being born now, especially out on pasture, uh, that umbilicus or that umbilical cord is certainly considered an open wound. And that's why we uh, recommend that these lambs have their navels dipped not only to protect from this, but also from navel ill itself that can also cause some joint ill uh, down the road. Um, but also other open wounds we may be creating as producers uh, occurs through identification, whether that be placing a tag, uh, notching an ear, putting a tattoo in. Uh, for all of our lambs, we may be docking off their tails, so removing that tail from that animal. Uh, from our males, if we do so choose to castrate. We're also taking those testes out and creating an additional open wound. So some things that we need to be cautious about uh, as well. 
What are some consequences of tetanus itself? We do see muscle stiffness and inability to walk or properly function. Uh, typically, it's going to be localized where that occurs. So most of the times we'll see these back legs of these lambs. That's what I've commonly seen this year. The back legs of these lambs just remain stiff and they're not able to have any type of function with those that hind quarter. Uh, as that infection persists, it'll go to the spinal column and then up to the brain. Uh, infections are commonly fatal. Um, there's just no way to get around this. So what we do um, recommend is that, well, one, we clear the barn of any type of debris. So any straggling nails, rusty nails, uh, any boards that may be able to puncture the animal. Um, of course, proper vaccination of CDNC, which we'll talk about here in just a bit. And then you can utilize these antitoxins, but they're only effective if you're able to catch this at an early stage. Moving on to some environmental issues, aside from the health and the parasites, uh, the first of which I'd like to take a look at is coccidiosis. Uh, again, coccidiosis are going to be these naturally occurring and present organisms, uh, but these are protozoa. And uh, the, the way that this infection occurs is that uh, our grazing animals uh, or our animals that are nipping at feed there in the barn are going to be ingesting these oocytes. These oocytes are going to be deposited, as you can see in this, this figure here, uh, out on pasture. And they'll go through a process where they'll spoilate, uh, they'll find them out on pasture or even in their feed troughs, and then they'll go through a process where uh, they will reproduce here and um, create more eggs and be shed back out. How can we prevent coccidiosis itself? Uh, decreasing stress. Now, I know, you know, uh, a lot of people have either weaned their lambs or thinking about weaning their lambs, and weaning is by far the most stressful um, procedure that we can place upon these young lambs' lives. Uh, so if you're able to do so, um, delayed weaning is beneficial in terms of reducing stress as well. Uh, decreased stocking density, good hygiene, of course, and we can use coccidia stats in our feed of, um, for example, menensin. What are some signs and symptoms? Uh, diarrhea, decreased feed intake, anemia, uh, dehydration due to the di diarrhea, and overall unthriftiness. Some other health issues that may arise uh, that can also be an issue for you as a manager are ringworm and sore mouth. And a ringworm is often referred to as club lamb fungus because that's often where we see it presented. Uh, and ringworm is not actually a worm, it is a fungus. So both ringworm and sore mouth can be contracted by humans as well. They have some similarities in that they're both skin uh, lesion type diseases although one is fungal and one is viral. They both can be transmitted to humans through an open wound, and um, they are both difficult to treat. So with ringworm, what you'll usually notice is a circular lesion. The hair in that location will often fall off, and it will be in a circular pattern. The sizes of these lesions can vary greatly from very small to very large, and the uh, spores of that fungus are contained in the lesion. So when a healthy animal contracts ringworm, it's typically through a nick or a cut and uh, rubbing up on another animal that has a fungus or by cross-contamination due to uh, inappropriate biosecurity measures by us as managers, which is often why we see it at shows because we're touching multiple surfaces in areas where there are many lambs congregated together from different farms. Sore mouth, I mentioned before, is viral. It is transferred again through direct contact. Both humans and animals can contract and pass sore mouth. There are some vaccines for sore mouth. They're not super effective. We're going to talk more about that in just a second, but the best ways that you can keep sore mouth and ringworm from becoming a problem in your flock are to not bring in outside animals, to try to keep a clean flock yourself. When you do introduce new animals to your flock, they should be quarantined. Uh, in the case of sore mouth, it can take four weeks 
for this to really run its course and uh, start to heal and go away. So it would be recommended to quarantine new animals for at least a month before introducing them with the rest of your flock. Uh, because as many other viruses do, this can lay uh, undetected in the, sim in, in the system without showing signs that the virus is present. So keeping it out in the first place is the best way to start. There's really no need to vaccinate for sore mouth if you don't already have sore mouth. In the contrary, if you have a big problem with sore mouth and you suddenly decide to start vaccinating, it also won't take care of it. The vaccination for sore mouth is the live vaccine. So you give the animal a low dose of the sore mouth virus for it to fight off. So you can actually then, you're introducing sore mouth to your flock so that they are able to get over it. So if you don't already have sore mouth, you don't wanna be introducing it even through the vaccine. Uh, ringworm, there are many uh, over-the-counter medications that can be used for, wing, for ringworm. And none of them are really that effective and none of them are really labeled for sheep. So this would be extra label use of a medication if you chose a topical uh, fungicide to apply, which would require a script from your veterinarian. We're gonna talk more about uh, extra label use and having a good relationship with your vet in a little bit. Some other diseases that may uh, present themselves, and they're not really diseases, they are their health issues. One is fly strike. Fly strike is often an issue with animals that have chronic diarrhea, that have scours. Um, this can occur in sheep that have not had their tails docked. And uh, so we're talking about a sheep that are gonna have their tails on for a long period of time, not those little Easter roaster lambs that we were talking about earlier today, but rather grown sheep with long tails. The reason that fly strike becomes an issue is because fecal material accumulates on the tail, on the hind end of the animal, which attracts flies, which then lay their eggs, which then hatch, and um, cause severe problems on the animals. So one of the best ways to avoid issues with fly strike, one is to check that your animals are in good health and don't have scours, and two, to dock tails appropriately. An appropriate tail dock should cover the vulva of a female animal uh, or the equivalent length on a male. That will allow enough tail that they can uh, wag the tail and shake off fecal material if there's no tail there at all, then the fecal material can just run down, which is still another problem. So it really comes down to, to hygiene of the animals trying to prevent fly strike. And then wool blindness can also be an issue. The best way to prevent wool blindness is to shear sheep on a regular schedule so that they don't accumulate wool around the faces. Wool blindness was much more of an issue when the market was geared toward sheep with heavy fleeces, as you can see in the picture there on the slide. Uh, sheep that put on more wool are gonna have more potential issues with wool blindness, but many of our commercial market sheep uh, don't have a lot of wool on their faces and will have fewer issues. But you do wanna make sure that your animals can see their environment well and that wool is not inhibiting their ability to watch out for predators, to find food, um, and to maneuver through their environments. Some of those Back last, to you, Brady. Some of the last, thank you, Christine. Some of the uh, last few um, health issues that we'll talk about here revolves around uh, hoof management. We'll talk about two different types of hoof management, the first of which being hoof scald. Hoof scald is a bacterial infection, and uh, this scald is normally present in the, the feces, these bacteria that create and cause scald. Uh, these are most prevalent in our cool, wet conditions. So here in Ohio, this is ideal. I mean, uh, the weather, the, the, in the environment in which we're in, uh, with all this rain coming in the spring, uh, certainly an issue that we need to be cognizant of as shepherds and producers to take a look at um, with our animals. Rough materials will irritate those soft tissues, and as you can see here in this picture, right up there where those two hooves are going to meet that leg itself, where that soft tissue is being irritated. And this will result in lameness just due to the inflammation of this tissue. Uh, these animals won't want to put any pressure on these feet. 
and they don't want to have these toes rubbing against one another to further cause more irritation. On the other side of things, we need to think about hoof rot too. Now, hoof rot is a, also a bacterial infection. It's present in contaminated pastures. So again, be cautious when you're bringing in new animals into your facilities, your flocks, your herds, and have a good idea of their health uh, background. Uh, you certainly don't want to be bringing in an issue that you may not have yourself. This again is going to be most prevalent during wet and humid conditions. So we shouldn't be seeing a lot of um, foot rot at the moment. A lot of our, our limping or lameness occurring in our sheep is going to be caused by scald. But as we transition into these hot, humid summer months, we'll definitely see foot rot begin to manifest. Now, foot rot will in, set in uh, after foot scald. So it's going to use foot scald as its way for that bacteria to invade that hoof area, just that scald is going to be enough irritative uh, pressure on those soft tissues to make its way into that hoof. As you can see, it's quite grotesque. We can see lameness, inflammation, skin and hoof damage. Foot rot certainly has a very rancid specific odor to it. Uh, it can result in secondary infections, a fever and so forth. So how can we manage uh, foot rot a bit better? Uh, certainly we can use medications um, there's a lot of moisture involved in foot rot, so we can use iodine to our advantage to strip and remove a lot of that moisture from that area. Uh, we do recommend foot baths for our small ruminants. Now these foot baths can be as simple as putting them into your, your race well or your raceway after you're working a set of sheep, or you can put this in your entrance of your barn. Uh, so if animals want to go in and eat for the night, uh, need to get a drink, want to get out, uh, of the environment, they've got to walk through this foot bath itself. Um, we've got plenty of information on our sheep, OSU Sheep Team webpage at sheep.osu.edu on how to use and set up an appropriate foot bath. A lot of producers ask about vaccines. Currently, there are no vaccines available in the US, uh, but there are in places like Australia and New Zealand. One way, another way that we can help with the issues of hoof rot uh, is going to be practicing good. Uh, hoof trimming. Uh, we want to expose those um, bad hooves to oxygen as much as we can because uh, those bacteria do not thrive well in it. It also allows our zinc copper sulfate solutions to get into those uh, nooks and crannies of that hoof to, to get that appropriately soaked and get rid of that infection. If you've got some animals that are chronically ill or chronic limpers, we highly suggest that you consult with your veterinarian uh, to see how you can further help your animals in your flock. And I'll wrap up my section here with just some simple vaccination programs. And with vaccines, I read a nice piece again on the Sheep Team webpage where we were talking about, so, you know, why didn't my vaccination program work this year? And, uh, you know, we have so many different sheep operations in the U.S. and so many different ways to manage our sheep. And there's no right or wrong way, but we need to be cognizant of how we're, we are treating the health of our animals. When it comes to vaccines, uh, I always like to follow the strategy of the old uh, nomenclature of if it's not broke, don't fix it. And by that, I mean, if you don't have the disease currently on your farm, you certainly don't want to vaccinate it for it. Because once you start vaccinating for it, you will one, be introducing that, that disease to your flock and onto your operation. And two, you will have to provide a booster every year from there on out. Now, there is one exception. With every small ruminant operation, we strongly recommend that everybody provides a CD&T vaccination. Uh, now, with our lambs, those lambs should be receiving two to three vaccines, whether that be through the milk of the ewe, through passive immunity, or to the lamb specifically. A lot of times we've been seeing, too, that our vaccines aren't working because we're giving them to young, naive lambs. When lambs are born, they are born with a, um, with no immune system. They have a naive immune system. And therefore, we vaccinate our ewes for them to receive the antibodies that they need via passive immunity. But if we decide we want to vaccinate the lambs directly, it's recommended that we wait for at least 14 days. So any vaccine that's given to the lamb before 14 days of age will not be utilized effectively and efficiently by that lamb. And again, that information can be found on our OSU Sheep Team webpage. Now here's some of it, additional optional uh, vaccination programs. Again, we only recommend these if there's an issue. If you think you've got an issue, we strongly suggest that you work with your local veterinarian 
to see if that is the issue and whether they recommend you uh, implementing that type of vaccination program. For reproductive issues, there's Campylobacter or Vibriosis and Chlamydia. Uh, leptospirosis or Lepto, that can be feeding um, some uh, feeds that may be spoiled due to mold, such as our wet wrapped hay uh, or our silage products. Toxoplasmosis can also cause abortions. Uh, that can be carried by uh, wildlife as well as domestic cats that you may be having in your barns. And then think about pastorella. If you have a lot of issues with uh, pneumonia within your flock, it may be recommended that you give a pastorella vaccine. Sorry, I needed to unmute. <laughs> and uh, so I'm gonna come in here now and talk about your veterinary client patient relationships, which should be VCPR, not VPCR, my mistake. <laughs> and essentially what this, implies is that you need to establish and maintain a current relationship with your veterinarian. Your veterinarian has a responsibility to give sound advice based on your operation. So it's important that they get to know you, what you do in your operation, what kind of animals you have, what your goals are, and some about your site history. So they can help you develop a health program that makes sense for you. And we recognize that there is a shortage of veterinarians in many parts of Ohio. Regardless, find one that's willing to work with you so that you have a, uh, a network that you can turn to for help because some medications will only be available through your veterinarian and they cannot prescribe them to you if you don't have a current relationship with them. And this kind of bleeds over into the topic of the veterinary feed directive. VFDs came into play in 2017. We did a lot of programming through extension about VFDs. And first off, we should probably define what a VFD is. It's essentially a written statement issued by a licensed practicing veterinarian that authorizes the use of a drug or combination of drugs in or on an animal feed. So this does not apply to injections or oral drenches. This is applied to the feed or fed through the feed. This written statement will authorize you as the owner of the animal to feed um, feeds that contain a drug to treat the animals uh, that has to be approved uh, by the FDA. This is still fairly new and we may have some producers that are not aware or people who were previously in sheep and are thinking about getting back in so it's no longer really new, but new in the sense of a decade. And there's multiple reasons why this has come into play. Unfortunately, throughout agriculture and throughout the world, there are some people that have used medicated feeds unethically to promote weight gain or compensate for subpar management practices. Now that's not the norm by any means, but it does happen and it's an issue. But the biggest issues are the antibiotic feeds um, that are routinely used to prevent disease can lead to antibiotic resistance of drugs. And most of the drugs that we're concerned about here are those that are commonly used in both human and animal medicine. And since we're very concerned about antibiotic resistance developing, there's the implementation of the VFD. So what is gonna be on that VFD is gonna be the contact information for your vet, your contact information as the client, the premise upon which your animals are that the VFD applies, when it's issued, when it expires, the names of the drugs, the species and class of the animals. And then it's very important that you keep that VFD on record, both you, the vet, and the seller of that product for two years. This is subject to inspection if an issue did arise. This really comes back to human health. And I'm not gonna go step by step through this chart, but these are some of the medicines that were impacted right off by VFDs. And uh, the reason that these medicines were selected is because they're commonly used in human medicine so if we inadvertently overuse them in animal medicine, we can contribute to the development of those uh, resistant bacteria. 
and then not only cause issues for animal health, but also human health. The best things that you can do in response to the changes with VFDs, as well as all the other health aspects that we've talked about throughout the presentation today, are to establish and maintain a current relationship with your veterinarian that will vary, uh, the definition will vary depending on your veterinarian, but for most it's that they want to be on your farm to visit you at least once a year to say that you're current. They should have been to your farm and seen your animals at some point in time. And best of all, follow good production practices. When we do things like keep good housekeeping, keep an eye on genetics, uh, quarantine new animals before they come in, we can prevent a lot of the issues that we face with health. We want to make sure we've got that current relationship with the veterinarian, that we have a health plan and we're implementing it, that we're using the drugs we have to treat the problems we have responsibly so that they last for a long time. We want to store those products um, appropriately. We also want to source them from reliable places. We want to um, be familiar with the feeds we're feeding and how they're used appropriately, especially those that do contain a medication. Now, not all medicated feeds need a VFD. It's just those that are deemed medically important. Have an identification system. We've talked about this already some today. It's extremely important when you're thinking about health. You need to track how you're treating your animals, when, where, and for what. Practicing good environmental stewardship is going to be very important uh, when you look at things like parasites, especially. Make sure that you're maintaining a safe workplace, both for you and your animals, with things like tetanus, sore mouth, ringworm. We know that those are often transferred uh, due to a lack of biosecurity or that we have hazards in the workplace. Keep an eye on those for both you and your animals. Provide proper animal care when needed, or by medical care I mean, and also day-to-day -day care. Be familiar with your animals, how they should behave and what's abnormal, as we said at the beginning. And utilize the tools that are available to continually improve your system. There's never a time that you should stop learning and things are always changing. So stay up to date as best as you can with current issues and how to deal with them. So with that, we thank you for your time today. All throughout the webinars, for those of you, some of you have been with us from the very start, and we hope that this has been really helpful. It's sure been fun for us. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. Brady, anything to add? I don't think so, Christine. As Christine said, uh, thank you guys for hanging in there with us today. Thanks for joining us. We had a lot of fun. And as she said, if you need anything, we've got our contact information our slides that we provided and uh, of course be sure to check us out at osu sheep edu and also our facebook page at osu sheep team if any questions come to mind later don't hesitate to reach out we are still available to you although we're socially distancing we're available um, by email by phone so you know how to get a hold of us don't hesitate to do that Thank you so much, guys. This was really good. I really appreciate it. And I've learned so much today from you too. It's been great. I don't see any questions. I did put your contact information in the chat so that they can reach out to you so they do have further questions. So I guess with that, we're gonna wrap it up for the day. And I wanna thank everybody again for uh, tuning in. We'll be back tomorrow with horticulture items. So be sure and we'll be back at nine o'clock. So I hope to see everyone back then. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.